uh, we're, we're primarily consultants to companies that are having problems. We're kind of like the Ghostbusters. Who are you going to call? You want to add magic to your product? People call us. Let's see. You know, have... <laughs> so we're going to talk about the magic of audio design, a constructed reality. So I'd like you all to just, without turning around, look behind you with your ears. Now, you're in acoustic space. And from before we're born, we're, we're surrounded and bathed in sound waves. And we've been having these, you know, over millennia, we've used these for survival and for socialization and for communication. And for our purposes, they're for entertainment. And we live in acoustic space, but it's like breathing. We don't think about it most of the time. It's like there's all these noises going on and our brain filters it out. And in fact, um, it's so weird that when there's no sound, it's, it's, it's strange. When there's never no sound. And in fact, um, in media, um, Films and if you look in the libraries, there's you know there's this huge uh, libraries for room noise, white noise. What does that sound like? It's because we don't like it when it's really quiet, and you know they use it in films all the time. Um, uh, Scorsese, uh, Hitchcock used it famously. Um, gravity. Within a lot of gravity, there's no sound in space for the most part, so there's nothing. Everyone's floating around and it feels strange because there isn't any. It's a non-effect. If you want to make something sound really big, you've got an explosion coming up. The first thing you do is you have all the audio go away so you get the contrast of the explosion. Now, our ears are more than something to hang our glasses on. And let's see where I am. They're part of our early warning system. And you know, we can see in 360 degrees uh, here, in 360 degree audio. And um, our, we, can't, we can't blink our ears. We don't have uh, ear lids. So, so they're always on. Even while we're sleeping, we, you know, they're monitoring the world around us. And uh, this has a big effect on, on how we create media. Um, because hearing is passive, for the most part. You know, occasionally something gets your attention and you go to it. But for the most part, there's all this stuff going on. And it's mostly unnoticed. And that's because our brain has been hearing all these sounds forever. And so the brain sets the priorities about what's important. And for the most part, everything else is just ambient. And our eyes are active. We're always looking around and taking in tons of information. And because of that, the ears are kind of like the side doors to the brain. And this has a big effect on media. Because stuff is just coming in, and we have all these expectations about how things are going to work. But if we don't get them, then you know, it's a problem. So um, Byron Reeves and Clifford Nash at Stanford were doing a bunch of research, and they said, <clears throat> audio fidelity matters when its poor presentations sound unnatural, and people consciously monitor the content. And when it's good, they're immersed. But the, you know, here's the thing: if you consciously monitor the content, if the sound isn't good, it doesn't seem real to them. And so you're suspect about the whole product. And instead of being immersed, you're involved in going, well, "What's weird about that sound? There's something wrong there." So it has a big piece for us. And what this really has come around to us over time is that we found that good audio makes poor pictures look bad. But the reverse is not true. And uh, you know, good, um, you know, incredible images, high-res images, doesn't make the sound any better. So it's, it's, you know, people think, oh, it's all about the visual. But really, 
visual and audio are really equal partners. It's just that visual's more passive, it's quieter. So let's talk about the three amigos of audio design. Um, voice. Music. And sound effects. These great Foley artists from the 40s, I think, are doing a radio show. And um, so voice. Voice is very absorbing for humans. It's, it's, we have a large proportion of our brain that's focused on just understanding voice. And I think I've, I've read somewhere that a, uh, a baby at six months can distinguish between 16 different voices. And that's, a, that's incredible for such a young child. But what it means in software is that when the kids hear a voice, it means someone is present. So, you know, there's someone there to play with. There's someone there who's going to listen to you. There's someone to interact with. It's all implied because we see computers as social actors. And when you have a character that's there and connecting with you, you expect some kind of a relationship. <coughs> so um, voice means that someone is present. And even if it's... Um, <coughs> the character is snoring. The kids know someone's there, and they're motivated to go in and wake them up. Wake them up and come and play with them. But it's the audio cue that lets them know someone is there. Even if you can't see them, even if it's dark, you know that there's someone there. So the other thing that's interesting about voice is that in the, in the three amigos of audio, voice is always in the foreground. You're listening to me. You're not listening to a door closing or the glasses or you know, anything else that's going on. And uh, everything else tends to support the voice. We care about storytelling and all that. It's really important to us. So, um, voice makes us care about characters. So here's some of our noodle bugs from our math the noodle words. That's an invitation. They're inviting you. They're saying hi. We care about these characters. And the kids care about them. But voice is amazing because you can imply more than the text by itself. <clears throat> this is part of the magic of voice. Hey, you hurt? 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 All with the same words. We get to imply almost anything. It's a huge vocabulary and it's all in emotional content. <clears throat> so, the voice is also tells us um, it's full of social cues. <clears throat> but, you know, they've been using this in television for years because if someone else likes it, why we're supposed to like it? And so, you know, you hear laughter, you hear all the other kind of things that go on. We grew up with canned, canned uh, here's your emotional cue for what you're supposed to be feeling right now. And you never hear anybody do this. You never hear anybody do this. How does your body feel right now? It doesn't feel that good, you know. Because, like, oh, what are you doing for? Who's having a hard time? What's going on? It actually really affects how you feel. And that's the thing about uh, social cues, is that we're learning all the time in, in the characters' uh, voice intonations or how they're acting, what's really going on with them. <laughs> and um, voice, along with most human um, sounds, are infectious. This is whole the theory of the uh, limbic resonance, but that, you know, you come into a room where there's been a fight, and uh, the cat comes into a room where there's been a fight, and the cat hides under the bed. Pat, the cat can feel it the same way you can. You're feeling sad, and the dog kind of licks you. The dog is feeling that. That's part of a uh, limbic resonance. And so uh, certain things you can put into your apps that are fun, like um, one of the best is laughter. That affects our physiology. 
you feel better. Some people think it cures cancer. And I could come up here and do a 15 minute talk where all I did was have different lab tracks on here and all of you would feel really good by the end of it because it just feels good to make us laugh. Uh, the Dalai Lama uh, smiles as part of his practice. There's a whole piece about just doing this. It affects your physiology. So um, voice it has all these in, uh, human sounds are really important. The next one we'll talk about is music. <laughs> directly to our emotions. And it's amazing how it moves us around. You know, I'll play that in the morning, I'm up and going, it's like a cup of coffee. Or <laughs> trying to find this I was looking to these tracks for the Put on a sad sound, and I'm, I'm, I'm crying. I'm, I'm sad here you know, because I, I can't listen to any more of these tracks. So get you up. Get you up you know, like, you know, what's going to make you get up and play air guitar? It's moving you emotionally. It moves us in all these directions. This is an amazing tool for a designer. Is you can go this way, you can go that way, you can just do amazing things with it just by implying it. So, music is also used to set the vibes. I used to tell my kids when we were in the movies, if, it was, if the cellos came on, it was likely it would be scary. And I'd lean over and I'd go, look out, the cellos are coming, the cellos are coming, you know. It's like, what's that? This is music messing with us. Cellos, look out! <laughs> and, uh, it's, it's such a classic piece that our 16-year-old daughter has never seen Jaws. And when I played that for her, she went, oh, Jaws. You know, like, it's become cultural, you know, like, it's, look out! It's, it's, a, it's a, is that a mind of you know, so. Um, and we, it can also be used for um, rhyming. How do you apply that to children's software? When we were working on the, uh, the tortoise and the hare, mostly what they do for the whole app is run. And uh, so we wrote a reggae piece for the tortoise, and, uh, and then we wrote a the hare. And even if the character got this small and was running around in the background, the kids automatically knew who it was because they had already learned the musical cues just after a page or two. So it really works to develop a character. Um, so next, we'll talk a little bit about sound effects. <laughs> so, the sound effects are good for a lot of things. One of them is getting your attention. And uh, only certain, you know, certain sounds will make you stop and turn around and look. It's also really good at giving feedback. Um, why does your phone, the camera on your phone, do this? You know, because it feels right. You know, it, you know imagine it went, you know, you, you, you wouldn't take many pictures. <laughs> and so this is about why you know the feedback that you get through sound effects is so important. It's been satisfying, and if it's good, you don't notice it. It's invisible. Oh, it's a camera click, you know. But uh, if you get the wrong thing, it's really bad. And this is really ties us into um, one of the um, the third rule. The third rule of interactive design is that everybody wants a reaction to their action. And kids especially, they expect it. They think that the computer should act like the real world. They want it right now. And if you don't give it to them, it's not working. So, ah. <laughs> love to throw those in there. Um, so, as Warren was saying yesterday, 
Um, this is good feedback. You know when you've connected, you get a sense that you're moving something metal around on the screen, and um, it works. So it's a constructive reality. And uh, when we were first doing, um, come out of time. Uh, 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 the, uh, we were working on a product but uh, uh, with a monster, and there was a store creek when it opened, and the, uh, we heard it over and over and over again because we were prototyping it, we were selling it, we were demoing it, and I got to know the door creek intimately, and then uh, I saw it in sitcoms, I saw it in television, I saw it in commercials, I saw it in movies, uh, it, it just it, it showed up everywhere, you know. Yeah. And every time I saw it, it would completely throw me out of the experience. I'm going, they made that up. They just stuck a sack in there, even though I know all about this. And it's a constructed reality. Everything is. Everything in a movie is a constructed reality. Sound effects, it's moving, it's moving you all around. It's all part of art design, of uh, sound design. But it's amazing how we don't trust it because we've grown up with it. Um, so what, we use our imagination to, uh, to, to, audio takes us to places because we make assumptions.
if you have something that's too uh, much that too much of that sound, kids, the boys are going to come and just go keep hitting the thing, the thing. So what we've done over the years is we mix it into everything. So here's a, 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 a our um, app Noodle Words, and the kids pump it up. There's a fart extender, and we slip it in over, and the kids like it. They play it over and over. It's not really a fart. No, it's a, it's a, you know it's, it's pump. It's a balloon letting out air, but it, it sort of is. It reaches that same space. So there's ways to slip in almost anything that um, makes it work well. So sound. Oh, sorry. So sound design is the art of getting the right sound in the right place at the right time. And why is it magical? Because you can draw with it via animation, uh, imagination. Um, voice speaks to our deep social wiring. It adds emotional and mood content. And it completes and enhances the experience. And why do we do that? Well, actually, which all means that good audio makes poor pictures look better. It's, it's, I just want to hit that one again because it's important. Uh, Question that? Right oh, sorry. Maybe. This one? Next. It was a list. Next. Yeah, the list. You want the list? Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, and Darren doesn't want me to show up. Yeah. Okay. This one. Say to you all, I don't know how many uh, puppet productions you've watched, but um, I'm sure that, uh, that you, you're fully conscious of the fact that uh, when you see those puppets moving across the screen uh, on some subconscious level, you know that they end at the waist. There is underneath that puppet, there is a puppeteer. But as that puppet is walking across the screen, screen, you're hearing crunch, crunch, crunch crunch of the footsteps, and it completes a picture that doesn't exist on the screen in a way that nothing but good sound design could. What these guys give us is absolute magic in the work that we do, and boy, can it do it for you. Thank you. Thank you. Question? So I love the presentation, and um, I just wanted to ask you about annoying sounds, because when we were playing with our Pacific product, we let the kids assign the sounds to the actions that the characters take. And there are certain sounds that kids just react badly to. But there's always like the T-Rex like sound. Like the T-Rex sound we picked. And, but then there's always that kid that loves the T-Rex and puts it on everything. So would you just talk a little bit about how you um, moderate those d disparate audiences? Well, if you're, you're giving them free choice. And so you're giving them free choice. And whatever choice they make is a good one because it's what they want. Um, I try to keep the characters in continuity so that you can only mess with them. You can't assign a different voice to my main characters because you have, I'm building a relationship with the characters and what the kids' expectations are. Any other? Hi there, my name is Lisa Ray Dorris. That was an awesome presentation. Thank you. Um, I just curious to know how you think about vocalizing sound for example, sounds way differently in five different languages. Uh, it's tricky. Uh, I, my, my living books are in uh, up to seven languages. And I went in on, and, and sat in on most of the recording sessions, and it's very difficult. Is that what you're talking about? I have to do it, and you have to localize. It's really tricky. Um, and, and you just have to be there, and you have to try and get whoever's doing the voice talent to follow the, 
um, mood of what it is that you're creating. The other problem that we have with voice talent is, is that sometimes kids age out. When I was working on our first Arthur Tate on the title before there was an Arthur TV show, um, I had a kid and his voice was a little high. We had to pitch him down. And the second product, he was right at the right age. And then by the time we got the third product, we had to pitch him up to keep him sounding the same. But we were able to use the same kid through three or four products. Okay, thank you. Thank you for